Okay. Let's... Yeah, we're in business. Do you want to check you can go forward and backwards? Uh... On our left and right, either press space bar for forward. Or... There we go. Yay. Okay, <laughs> that's easily working. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, initially the plan was that there weren't going to be any restrictions on school attendance in the pandemic because we're education. School's important not just for learning purposes, but for child welfare purposes and well being purposes and all sorts of things. And like I said, so initially our thinking was things like we'll have to bring in retired staff to cover for staff who are off sick for a bit. Um, so that was our thinking. I will say one thing people always talk about, you know, government closed schools. At no point did we actually ever close schools. They were always open, although initially they were open for, uh, you know, when, when the country did go into lockdown, they were initially open only for vulnerable children and key worker children. So that was, you know, it wasn't that much attendance. So our plan was, you know, uh, keep schools open, uh, bring in retired teachers. The decision to break from this plan and Again, I'm going to use the word close schools just as shorthand, even though we didn't actually close them, was was taken over the weekend. I think it was like 13th of March to Monday, 16th of March. And this is where the government abandoned its contain, delay, research and mitigate strategy uh, and took us into the first full national lockdown, which was announced on Monday, 23rd of March. And I think, you know, that was very much driven by uh, some of the updated modeling from Neil Ferguson and John Edmonds. I think had used IC, London ICU bed data to re-estimate the scenarios. But I think even already before this, and John, uh, John Reed and Mike Tilsey can correct me if I'm wrong, I think there are people like John and Mike and others who realise actually, you know, this could become big and actually need to have some sense of what's happening in schools. Um, and I think John uh, might have been the first, or maybe Mike was the first, they were amongst the first to then email me saying, can we get access um, to student data. And I think John did, or one of the two did say, we do have national pupil data access already for some of the stuff we do. Um, we'd like to repurpose it. Now, normally, if you have to repurpose uh, government data for another use, you have to put in a big business case and uh, things like that. It takes time. But at this point, we thought, well, this might be a national emergency. And so there is an emergency, there is a condition where under national emergency, you can suddenly give access to data. So we use that. So uh, some of the modelers then suddenly got uh, quick access to what they were allowed to repurpose the data that we had access to. Um, and so, like I said, at this point, we then go into the full national lockdown. And as a novel virus, you know, so SARS-CoV-2 presented huge challenges because we knew virtually nothing at this point. I remember quite early on, we thought that phone transmission was the most important thing. But as we learned, we gained better tools uh, and we built up response structures within the department. We became more able to respond uh, accordingly. So that's kind of, you know, eventually we had two lengthy spells of attendance restrictions. Then we had a system of restrictions within tiers. Then we had other measures, um, which were like, you know, guidance to schools about things they should do, which also came in. Okay, so school closures uh, come in. Uh, and they're on the agenda, but they're really expensive. And we kind of had them on the agenda from the start. Uh, and the reason I say from the start is because, um, again, there was no actual experts in the department. So I brought together a small team just to think, like, let's think this is a massive flu pandemic that's going to hit everyone. What does this mean? And we did have on there possibility of schools closing, but very unlikely. And we did talk about other risks and things that you could do, like we might have to have an online learning offer and things like that. Um, but then sort of when uh, um, the risk from the pandemic became clearer, our sales of education and uh, wider government started thinking beyond the existing plans for a flu pandemic and what could be done to reduce transmission while schools remained open. So that was kind of the initial thing we were doing. And we kind of thought that, you know, for early on that, there was a risk that the pandemic wouldn't just be a short-term challenge. Um, and like I said, I should make clear that this was all very, uh, all very uh, it was internal thinking and was clearly not led by experts. And I think the point I'm trying to make here is that there were loads of measures that we that have been thrown at schools uh, to attempt to reduce transmission of SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, we kind of had to make uh, decisions on the fly in the face of limited evidence. I mean, in the, in the very some of the very early decisions, you know, very limited evidence and limited expert in, input as well. I think not just evidence. And you know, over time, we found that some of those things maybe weren't as important. Others, uh, maybe some measures may not really have done much. Who knows? Um, and some potentially have costs in the long run, which might exceed their benefits. But I think that the thing I'm trying to get is the environment was making decisions on the fly with limited evidence and at that point, but a limited expert input. Um, like I said, uh, for our part, the priority had always been uh, throughout to argue to keep schools fully open. Uh, and we've had a cocktail of measures, I guess, you know, that's kind of helped achieve this since about early 2021. But over time, sort of um, things did change because we did start getting um, more expert input into the department. So uh, we had, uh, although it's not officially called Spy Kids, all of us call it Spy Kids. So, so Sage set up a subgroup on, it was officially called the Sage Task and Finish Group on Children, but I think it was Angela McLean who first called it Spy Kids and that stuck. Um, then there was the Environmental Monitoring Group who also did a, provide a lot of input uh, into the department around things like uh, air cleaning uh, and ventilation and things like that. So there was improvement over time uh, in terms of the expert advice we were getting, you know, including kind of having our own Sage subgroup. Um, there was better communication with stakeholders. I think, you know, let's be honest, I think we all in, you know, all of us in government in the first couple, first month or two were in a bit of panic. Uh, and actually, I think over time, you know, to be fair to cabinet office and number 10, they got much better at sort of um, structuring their requests to departments uh, and it was easier to respond to that. And we had better engagement with cabinet office and the number 10 with other departments. Uh, Sage became much more regular. So there's a lot of excellent advice coming out of Sage that we used. And also, um, excuse me, uh, the ONS really swung into action. And I think you know the ONS. I, you know, I, I have to say, are one of the one of the heroes of the pandemic. With you know the school infection survey, the COVID infection study, all that sort of stuff, which we heard about today. Um, and the other thing that then started happening, rather than having sort of an amateur CSA like myself, although Angela's told me off of this, uh, we did start embedding science within DFE. Um, so we brought in a uh, consultant pediatrician and researcher as deputy CSA to help. And we also started setting up a science team uh, within DFE. Um, some, I think it's quite a few of whom are attending today. So our structures within government also started changing as a response to this. Um, so, so things were changing on that front, uh, science embedded. We also started getting much better engagement with our policy colleagues as the department then kind of restructured itself to deal, you know, pretty quickly did start restructuring itself to deal with the pandemic. Um, so I was, you know, I was co-leading the uh, our COVID response unit within the department. For a while, I handed over a lot of our chief, my chief analyst responsibilities to someone else who took those on for a bit. Uh, we organized how the analysts were structured to deal as a, in a coordinated way to requests for data and analysis that were coming from cabinet office at number 10 or whoever else. Um, and so the, the, the structures around decision-making uh, and getting evidence for decision-making, both in terms of you know, how we were structured within department, our engagement with SAGE, uh, with SAGE subgroups and various other academics did improve. And of course, so, so we, I think we do have examples of lots of good flows of data and evidence that came in. Um, now, it was still kind of, you know, uh, an unknown situation and some, you know, some decisions were by necessity, I think, rushed. Um, so, for example, when the alpha wave uh, started, you know, we really started, you know, worrying about that sort of, I guess that was around December 2020. Um, we put in place a bunch of return to school uh, restrictions, sort of late, uh, late, uh, Jan uh, late December 2020, uh, January 2021. Um, was there some optimism bias on our part initially when we did try and keep uh, London schools open when Alpha was becoming quite, you know, the data think Alpha was becoming quite an issue in uh, London, possibly. 
Um, but like I said, I think our priority was to try and keep schools open. And it is difficult to respond to the first high impact variant, again, even though, you know, we'd have uh, the original one type uh, version, you know, you get a new variant and you're not quite sure how to respond. Um, so, so that was an issue. I think another issue is it's always been quite difficult to nail the communication of risk. Um, and I think, uh, you know, sometimes evidence doesn't quite align with our needs. Sometimes there's limited modeling from reliable sources around spreading children. I think, you know, uh, uh, Mike and John and Ellen and Julia and, and, and all the others who helped us will probably admit that, although we have some contact data around uh, 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 data on contact patterns amongst children and in schools, it is quite limited, of course, which has some implications for modeling. Um, and so, so there's, you know, limited modeling for reliable sources, even for informed scenario discussion with experts. And also you've got to remember, you know, um, our policy colleagues, are, my policy colleagues are wonderful, but they're not analysts, they're not uh, necessarily scientists. So they kind of often want things broken down into a simple chart they can understand as they're rushing and struggling to make decisions. So some of the stuff around how we communicate risks, I think is one I would look back on. Um, I think I've already mentioned the links between departments got much, much better over time. There was more joint working between us and DHSC. There was more joint working between us and uh, what I guess is now called DLUT, because they, you know, Alan Penn leads on buildings. He's, he's leading a safe subgroup on that with Cap Noakes. Um, so that improved. Uh, I, I think I mentioned that, you know, the relationships between ourselves, not just ourselves, but all departments of capital officer number 10, um, improved. But even then, a lot of decisions on a national emergency like this are going to be made by number 10 very quickly all of a sudden so even this is not a failing i think this is just a, the reality of the situation you know because of all the scientific evidence and advice going to the pm uh, from sage via patrick and via chris sometimes you know decisions were made quite quickly and i think rightly so and so sometimes departments didn't have time to really prep for some of these decisions and get all their guidance right, you know, but that's kind of just how the world was then, you know, normally policy decision making timescales are a lot longer than they were, than they, were, uh, than they are during a, a major pandemic. So kind of that's where we were. So, so what's the future about? I think the future really is about there are still quite a few ongoing unknowns. Um, so, uh, you know, th th there's a question about uh, what low cost measures could be used in schools to effectively reduce transmission when needed, you know, can we design schools or the school day better? So there's questions that we're still uh, looking at around that, you know, can we get better contact uh, data on contact patterns in schools? And that's stuff we're currently working with Juniper on to see if we can, you know, get some better data on that over time, because I think that's what, that's important, not just from a COVID basis, but actually for any community, you know, transmissible disease, Basis. If we want to keep schools open or have less uh, days lost uh, because of flu uh, or whatever else, that's quite important. So we're working with Juniper on that. Um, there is stuff we would, you know, we could do with knowing more about in terms of effects of repeat infection. You know, do you get worse health with repeat infections versus better immunity? There's a bunch of questions uh, around that. Uh, there's, you know, we're not. We still have ongoing infection illness. So we kind of still need to try and have a handle on what do staff and child absences look like, how much will illnesses vary over the year, how long until some form of stability, uh, what will that stability look like? So there's still lots of unknown questions. A big one is still, of course, the burden of long COVID, both in children and in the workforce. And of course, you know, these measures have, they, they protected people in terms of infection, we think, but they also have, they've also caused harms. So, you know, uh, there is stuff the department is working on in terms of learning recovery. Uh, there's stuff the department's working on it that there seems to be a lot more hidden homeschooling going on. Um, we know there's been, you know, you heard already, there's been some mental, there's been a mental health hit to kids and how do we recover from that? And then, you know, there's also stuff we still don't know enough about around the cost of specific measures, you know, actually face coverings for children, you know, uh, what impact does that have at various key development stages if you're wearing masks in school, um, 
what impact do uh, does limiting social activities have? You know, stuff we need to learn more about. Okay, I'm going to shut up there because uh, I think it's always better that I talk less if we get questions. Um, so I will leave it there for now. Uh, I think I'll just summarise that. My God, I'll be grateful for all the support we got from many people who are here today. Uh, it would have been a much worse situation without all that support. Um, it was a bit wild, you know, and like I said, we did have to make some decisions on the fly. Uh, I think we're in a better place now and better understanding, but there are still unknowns. And I will now actually shut up. Thanks, um, Osma. That's uh, that really interesting to hear kind of your perspective on how all of this has gone. Um, we've uh, we've got a question in the chat um, from Tom King, uh, who says, is there an education view on helping people understand exponential growth or more generally how to present evidence about policy decisions? So the exponential growth is an interesting one. Um, I had a senior special advisor speak to me a while back saying, my God, it's quite difficult to get people to understand exponential growth. It is quite difficult to get some people to understand exponential growth. And you kind of, we've ended up trying to do it through pictures or the whole, you know, grain of rice and chessboard thing. But it's interesting that exponential growth is a concept I think a lot of people struggle with. Um, on pres so presenting evidence about poly decisions. Are you talking, I, I'm, Tom, I'm assuming you talking about presenting evidence that will hopefully inform policy decisions. I'm going to assume that's what you're talking about. I, yeah, sorry. So, so feel free to chime in uh, on video if you like, or with, oh, here we go. Of the public view. Yeah, so, so that's interesting. So, so I mean, uh, uh, on, in terms of evidence, presenting evidence about policy decisions on, for the public view. I mean, that was, during the pandemic, that was pretty much delegated to Chris and Patrick at the press conferences. Um, um, I mean, I mean we, we, we published lots of guidance and a lot of the guidance and we published lots of reports, but that's not quite the same thing as really, that's making evidence available, which is not necessarily the same thing as presenting it. Um, I think I, I will say this. I mean, it was a pretty manic time, and everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of our time is just caught up. So a lot of our time. So so with the one, the one where we did spend a lot of time was presenting evidence to the teaching unions, um, and having Q and fairly regular question and answer sessions with the teaching teachers unions because they were a key uh, constituent here um, and uh, Jenny Harry's uh, was involved in those as was Charlotte Watts as was Russell Viner as was myself as was our deputy so we did so we didn't you know we weren't able to you know do that sort of communication and Q&A with everyone uh, but we did try and do with some of the key, key constituents Uh, yes, there was communication between education departments in other countries. Uh, so uh, there is a unit at, I can't remember what the full unit's name is, at Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office that sort of works on the UK government's behalf, trying to find out what's going on in other uh, education departments. Uh, and sh I think that team actually reports into Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Watts, who's the CSA at FCDO. So we're getting lots of stuff from them. But also, of course, a lot of the uh, academics who helped us also have international contacts. So we were getting a lot of information from them as well, plus our international unit uh, within the department also had some contacts, so they were getting some stuff. So there was, it wasn't just, so it wasn't just, you know, we look at all this from a UK lens purely. Ministers did want to know what was happening in other countries, so they did ask on occasion. Um, so yeah, it wasn't it wasn't quite as closed as we only look at the UK. Uh, Sheila, I see you've got your hand up. Osama, so on reflection, do you think anybody should be a, a, a policy advisor in a pandemic who does not understand exponential growth? Um, let me put it a different way. Uh, I, so, and I think there's a move within government uh, 
continuing moves within government to get policy officials and policy advisors uh, to better understand how always had to use data and evidence uh, and expert input into policy decision making. Um, you know, whether on one specific thing, uh, I don't know. I, I think, uh, so what, how would I put it? I think we should have put more, all of us involved. I think because all of us, you know, even if you're in economics, you get expelled into growth because of growth theory and everything else, right? I, I think, you know, could all of us who were presenting things, whether it's, you know, Patrick and Chris at the press conferences, whether it's us CSAs, could we have put a bit more effort into that? Even some SPADs who actually have an analytical background, possibly. Um, whether they, you know, whether up in advance, I have to say, here, take a test, do you understand exponential growth? I think that's a bit challenging. But yeah, I think, and I don't think it's just, you know, the stuff around communicating things like exponential growth. I think, you know, how we can, it was, it's very, I was talking to David Spiegelhalter and actually I was talking to the guys at the Met Office who were kind of used to trying to, trying to present risk in a consistent way using language. Um, and one of the things I've said is across government, we need to start working on language for presenting risk because actually the language matters because a lot of people aren't going to understand risk if I show them some charts. But if I start using language in a consistent way, that might be a way forward. Wonderful. Thanks so much, um, Asana. I think we've, we've unfortunately run out of time and I think it's time for uh, a bit of a break. Uh, Jane, did you want to take the reins? Um, yeah, uh, so it's just to say um, uh, we've got a coffee break now until half past. Um, I do hope you can all return for our sort of panel discussion session at the end. We've got a great panel on board. Um, and just to remind